Well, as you said, the, 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 the memories are stored in our brain, but in other words, it's not, maybe not necessarily saying that clearly at the point, well, this memory of this concept is stored here, and this uh, concept is stored there, it's connected in multiple ways, but basically different areas of the brain are involved in different types of memory, which also means that certain kinds of brain damage can harm certain kinds of memory, not just your memory in general. For example, explicit memory involves the hippocampus, frontal lobes, the amygdala. The implicit memory also involves the hippocampus, but more the temporal lobes, the cerebellum. So, for example, let's take a look here. Your frontal lobes is very much involved in episodic memory. So your frontal lobe is essentially involving like the things that happen to you in your life, your memories of the events that happen to you. Your frontal lobes are essentially involved in uh, the storage of this kind of memory. The amygdala is big on emotional memories. Amygdala is part of your limbic system. And basically emotions like anger and uh, fear are involved in the amygdala. So, so if there's damage to the amygdala, you actually have difficulty expressing those kinds of emotions. Uh, the temporal lobe is involved in explicit memory in terms of uh, also its priming. Likewise, the hippocampus as well. Um, and the cerebellum is involved in implicit memory. Your, your cerebellum essentially allows you to type fast. It allows you to ride your bicycle. The memories in your brain that allow you to move your fingers that fast and move your feet so that you can ride your bicycle properly, that comes from your cerebellum. So if you have damage to your cerebellum, you're going to have a hard time riding a bicycle. You're going to have a hard time typing fast. But if you have damage, to, say, to your hippocampus or your temporal lobe, well, you're going to have a problem with your explicit memory, your memories of various facts, of various uh, things that you're trying to remember. If you have damage to your frontal lobe, you might have some kind of amnesia where you don't remember what happened to you in the past. So all of these uh, different parts of the brain are involved in memory in different ways. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about retrieval now. Now we're going to be talking about how we uh, are trying to bring this information that we are trying to remember and be able to process, you know, being able to, to retrieve it from our long-term memory and be able to deal with it. And also talking about how, uh, you know, the, the difficulties that we often have in doing this. One of these uh, difficulties involves the serial position effect. Basically, there are two, way, two types of serial position effects, the primacy effect and the recency effect. With the primacy effect, it turns out that we are pretty good at remembering the first few items on a list. If we are given a list of things to remember, this list of things could be a shopping list. It could also be just a lecture that you're hearing in psychology that may start at the beginning and you're processing the information at the beginning of the lecture. Well, this information that you're processing at the beginning, at the top of the shopping list and at the beginning of the lecture, you're going to have a good chance of remembering this information. Why? Because you're going to be able to be rehearsing this information. You're going to have time to do so. You're, you're, you're processing this information right away into your short-term and then into your long-term memory. So you're able to take this information and store it in your long-term memory. So if you have to remember the stuff on an exam, the stuff at the beginning of the lecture, you have a pretty good chance of remembering because you are processing this more deeply. Now, what about the recency effect? You also have a pretty good memory for items that happen, or the items at the end of the list. So maybe with the shopping list, the last few items on the list you have a pretty good memory for. Uh, they're still part of your 
short-term memory. They're still fresh on your mind that you're still working with. So when you walk out of the classroom, for example, you still might be processing the information that you learned at the end of the lecture. It's still in our short-term memory. You can retrieve it. You know, once it, you can put it into your sort of your long-term memory and retrieve it. Now the problem comes from the stuff in the middle. The stuff in the middle of the lecture. The stuff in the middle of your shopping list. The items in the middle of the lecture. Well, you're still busy processing the stuff talked about at the beginning. It's interfering with you trying to learn the information you're hearing in the middle. So that's a, a difficulty, I guess, with long lectures is that, you know, you know, there may be a lot of stuff in the middle that you're trying to remember and you're going to have a difficulty doing so. So you haven't had the chance to rehearse it because you're it's still interfering, you know, you're interfering with the stuff you, you've already learned a few minutes ago. Furthermore, if it's in the middle, it's too far away at the end of class for you to process it any further. So you're, it's no longer in your short-term memory and you can't rehearse it anymore because it's interfering with what you were already trying to rehearse, trying to learn. So it's difficult. A way to deal with this is to perhaps, maybe when you're do, you know, thinking about a shopping list, maybe, uh, maybe change the order of things around a bit, maybe start shopping for the stuff in the middle first, maybe, um, when you're trying to um, learn a lecture, you know, maybe kind of break it up a bit into chunks if possible. Kind of have a new start, maybe have a break in between, like a three-hour class where we can have a break in between. That way you have two beginnings to work from. If you're reading a chapter or textbook, you don't have to just start from the beginning and end it when you're studying. When you're studying, you can maybe pick up in the middle and start there, and that'll help you remember stuff in the middle a little bit better. Uh, we're talking about retrieval. There are a number of different ways. There are two types of tasks that we tend to which are We try to recall something or recognize something. So recall and recognition. With recall, we are trying to just with, you know, maybe uh, without any kind of cue necessarily, trying to remember a particular concept. So a definition of a concept, you know, uh, what is the definition of armadillo? You know, you have to say, okay, let me, let me try to remember that. So you're recalling that information and try, trying to come up with the answer for that. Recognition is a type of task where you might be asked to see something. So, for example, let's say I show you a picture of a groundhog, a picture of an armadillo, and a picture of a cat, and I say, pick out the armadillo. And you pick out the armadillo in the middle, and that's an easy task. And it turns out that recognition is a lot easier than recall. If I were to give a test in psychology as a recall test, that would be an essay exam. Here is the question, write an essay to answer the question, and in that case, you have to come up with the answer yourself. For a recognition test, that would be like a multiple choice test. The correct answer is right in front of you. All you have to do is recognize it. You don't have to remember everything, you just need to recognize the correct answer. This helps you if you are, if maybe you don't have a partial memory of the concept, but maybe seeing it there gives a trigger to get a cue for you to remember it. And therefore the recognition has to definitely get easier than the recall task. Uh, oftentimes when you are presented information in one context, you are better able to remember it in that same context. So if you heard about and again if you heard the information first, you know, maybe uh, hearing it you know, allows you to remember it, hearing it as well. So in other words, your, uh, how, you, how it's presented is going to uh, affect how you're going to retrieve it too. Um, for example, if you learn something in a particular college classroom and then take the test in an entirely different classroom, you might actually have a little bit of difficulty 
with memory in that case, with retrieval, because the context of being in that particular classroom, in that particular seat, might facilitate the learning of a concept. It, or it acts as a trigger, it acts as a retrieval cue. And if that cue is gone, if you're no longer in the same classroom, it makes it a little bit harder to actually uh, to remember it. So he's doing very interesting research using babies here. Uh, the baby has tied to its foot a string connected to a mobile. So if the baby kicks the string, it moves the mobile. The child is happy. It can move the mobile itself. Okay? Well, if you put the child in a similar, in the same crib, but with a different uh, design in the wall of the crib, it actually takes the child a little bit longer to learn the task again. It's relearning. What, what that means is, obviously, the color of the crib has no bearing whatsoever on the ability to kick the, the string and move the mobile. But the, uh, the different kind of... Uh, but, you know, from the baby's perspective, that's just one of the cues as far as the, the, the positive memory. So it, it actually, the child is, is having difficulty when the cue is different. 